Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, and welcome to Prague Chattery 777. We're talking about Rush, and we've made it to the tail end of the 80s with Presto, their 13th studio album released in 1989. Uh, now, this is largely regarded amongst uh, the Rush fan base as being the moment where Rush really starts to uh, phase out the use of synthesizers that uh, they'd become so... Uh, you know, reliant on um, earlier in the decade. And uh, to a large extent, that's true. You know, they are starting to phase the synthesizers out a little bit, but uh, it is still a transitional album, so there's still lots of synthesizers on here. They didn't go away overnight. Um, you know, I think there's actually a comparison to be made uh, with um, permanent waves and moving pictures. Um, you know, and that those are, that's kind of like a two-phase transitional period and where Rush went from being, you know, a you know, big progressive rock band to, uh, you know, a big synthesizer sort of rock band. And it took two albums to do that. It was Permanent Waves and Moving Pictures. And it's a similar thing um, with Presto and Roll the Bones. There's a, a two-phase transition uh, that takes them ultimately in a much heavier direction. Um, but that's certainly not here on this album. And I think that's one of the big criticisms that I have with Presto, actually, is that, uh, you know, Presto, as well as the previous album, uh, Hold Your Fire, they both sort of have rounded edges. Um, you know, there, there's a certain edginess uh, about Rush. You know, it's a, it's a core foundational part of Rush, a certain edginess, and it's not present on Hold Your Fire or Presto. Um, you know, they are probably the softest Rush albums uh, in the catalog. Um, and I think, you know, there, there's lots of different reasons for that. You know, I think, particularly around this period, um, you know, this is when Rush really discovered their songwriting. I think I talked a little bit about that in the Hold Your Fire video. Um, you know, they're, they're much more focused on, you know, supporting the melody and supporting the vocal rather than supporting, you know, um, you know a showcase of their instrumental chops or, you know, a, a, a crazy concept about, you know, the different hemispheres of the brain and planets and black holes and whatnot. Um, you know, it, it's much more of a, a singer-songwriter sort of mentality, even though it's uh, the three people. Um, and I think, you know, the lack of synthesizers would be a good thing at first, but I think there's something with the guitar tone, I think, on this album uh, that, that kind of that, that rattles my chain a little bit at times. It's really cool other times, but Life's in Use is a very, very, he uses that very cutting tone uh, that was perfect for albums like Power Windows when he had a lot of synthesizers to compete with. You know, he had a tone that would cut through all those dense layers of uh, synth. And uh, he still has that tone on Presto, even though the synthesizers have taken a much more supporting role. Um, so it kind of gives the album a bit of a cold quality as well. And, uh, you know, it's not that, you know, it doesn't have that crunching, heavy rock tone that, you know, Lifeson had done uh, previously. But, you know, like I said, it is a transitional thing, and, you know, ultimately they did find their way. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not that this is a bad album, but, you know, again, similarly to, to Hold Your Fire, you know, I, I think if, if, if I think of the weaker Rush albums, it's Hold Your Fire and Presto, probably, um, which may not be fair, but that's just, you know, my personal taste. It still is a, an important stepping stone record, you know, it's a record that they had to do in order to get to where, you know, they got to later on. Um, and it is, you know, significant in that it is, you know, the return to, you know, guitar riff based rock in a lot of ways. And there's a lot of great riffs on here. Um, and there's, there's some great ver other versions of uh, these songs to be found elsewhere on live albums where they do kind of heavy it up a little bit. And you kind of hear, hear that, uh, you know, classic edgy Rush character. Um, but yeah, we'll, uh, we'll make our way through the tracks here. Um, the album opens with Show Don't Tell. Now, I think this is the best track on the album. Talking about riffs, it is a fantastic riff. Uh, the very opening is very, very cool. We kind of get, it must be Peart on the um, Simmons drums, kind of getting this almost tribal effect. Really, really cool little rhythm, very pensive and atmospheric. And then, that, I guess, that, that riff comes in. Da -da 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 -da. They haven't done anything syncopated, you know, it, it's, it's a straightforward riff, but there's all kinds of weird rhythms and syncopation, um, you know, you know, syncopational things put into it. It's a strange use of that word, if it is a word. Um, so it's, it's just great. They haven't done a riff like that in a very long time at this point, so uh, that's a welcome return. There's a much better version of it to be found on different stages, uh, which was taken from the, some point in the 90s, I think. Uh, but it is a great song. Uh, there's still lots of synthesizers, you know, like the in the verses. In the second verse, we kind of get these sort of orchestral um, 
orchestrations that, kind of, that, that, that pop up towards that uh, second verse, which is really, really good. Uh, the bridge is fantastic. We get a nice little bass solo there, which is uh, which is nice to hear uh, Getty, you know, flexing his musical muscle there a little bit. And uh, yeah, it, it is just a fantastic song. It's uh, it's definitely my favorite on the album. Show don't tell is uh, is a rush classic as far as I'm concerned. Um, moving on, track two, we get Chain Lightning. Uh, now this is an okay song. Again, we we hear that the synthesizer influence is still very much there right off that intro. We get those really warm. Right, they're not really warm. I guess this is the cold sounding synths at this point. Um, with that. Uh, at the very, very beginning. The, the riff that comes in is quite cool. You get this weird kind of arpeggiated thing. Um, and, you know, it, it's an okay song. There's a few, there's a few nice surprises. Um, you know, towards the, I think it's the end of the second verse, or maybe it's the, the bridge. We get that orchestra. Um, oh, what's the, what, what's the word? It's an orchestra punch or something like that. Bow, 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 bow. There's a, there's a certain uh, orchestral hit. There's a certain word for it, but it was a distinctive sound in the 80s. It's on Owner of a Lonely Heart um, by Yes. That's one distinctive use of that sound. Um, so that's a nice surprise in Chain Lightning, but um, ultimately it's just a pretty okay song, really. A little too soft, you know? It doesn't have it doesn't have that punch that, uh, that Rush ought to have, but that's okay. Uh, we move on to uh, track three, The Past. Now, this is a very significant song, I think. Uh, this is one where we really see the uh, that songwriting that I was talking about. It's a very, very simple song, and, you know, every every single piece of, you know, every every decision they made when it came to the arrangement of the song is to support the vocal and uh, to support the lyrics. And uh, it's a very serious lyric by Pierre. You know, it, it deals with, uh, you know, suicide, and, uh, you know, I think teen suicide specifically, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, so there is there is a very um, a serious kind of tone to it, but uh, it's very simple and it's very stark. And uh, you know, I think the band is particularly particularly happy with this song. Um, it's certainly one song that on the album that I certainly wouldn't change. You know, it, uh, that 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 production suits it very 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 well. I think, um, but it's not one of my favorite Rush songs in the world. Uh, to be totally honest with you, it's not necessarily one of my favorites on the album, but it's a, it's a significant one for sure. Uh, we move on to track four, War Paint. Um, this is an okay song, um, kind of an album track for me. Uh, we definitely hear the, the guitars kind of coming back in. Do, 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 do. Um, you know, it, it's definitely led by the guitar, but the, the guitar tone just isn't there. It, it kind of has that tinny tone, even though it's not fighting the synthesizers. So, uh, you know, maybe it's more of a production issue than it is an issue with the song. Um, you know, there's still moments in War Paint where the synth is, you know, during the verses, the synthesizer is still, you know, an integral part of the composition there. But um, uh, it's it's an okay song, definitely not um, definitely not a highlight, not one of the best on the album. Uh, we move on to track five, though. We get Scars. I uh, know this one. Um, this one could have been taken out of any of the other '80s albums, to be honest. It could have been on uh, Power Windows or would have been a great track on Hold Your Fire because it is all it is all sequencer. Uh, there's no bass at all on Scars whatsoever. I think I said in the Grace Under Pressure video that I think Red Sector A is the only Rush song that has no bass at all, but uh, Scars is another case. Uh, but I actually love it. I think it's a great sort of weird atmosphere. It's the closest that Rush ever came to doing dance music, actually. Uh, but I love that sequence from I think that's just really, really cool. And then, you know, the way that this, the, the synth lines kind of, you know, pop in and out to create some, you know, cool atmosphere and whatnot. And it's, it's, it's one of the cases where Lifeson's, um, you know, tinny guitar tone actually works wonders because it creates these sort of windy effects. And uh, it's a real highlight for Peart on Scars as well. Uh, he does this is a, probably the peak of his textured drumming style. Right? It's very polyrhythmic. And um, you know, there's a there's a thing that I read where Peart talks about Scars, and he he talks about using um, you know using the drums in a way so it sounds like there's overdubs all over the place, even though it's all played. So it's a very polyrhythmic and very busy uh, sort of um, playing style. And he took the foundation, um, you know, the beat that he played in Scars became a foundation for lots of his drum solos uh, in the future. So that's kind of interesting as well. I think it's a controversial song, really, because it is, like I said, it's the closest Rush ever came to making a dance song. And uh, if you watch clips of them performing it live on the Presto tour, it's, it's funny because uh, Getty's playing with the synthesizer and he's got, um, he's got uh, samples of his own voice, you know. So you get, you know... 
you know, um, ooh, da 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 da, scars and pain, 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 atmospheric changes make them sensitive again. But uh, you know, the little the, the samples of his own voice are quite funny. But uh, it's a fun song, and it, it's very unique in their catalog. And it's it's actually, funnily enough, one of my favorites on the album. Surprisingly, perhaps, I really like Scars. Atmospheric and cool. Uh, we move on to track six, Presto, the title track. Uh, this is, yeah. There was a time when I thought this might have been like the epic of the album, but it, it isn't really. Um, you know, it, it it's it is a more extended kind of a song, I guess. But uh, it is very much, and it's still in that traditional songwriting mode. You know, there's still only a few chords to it. There's a cool little, there's a few cool little transitions here and there, as the song moves along. Um, it's a great reintroduction to the acoustic guitar. That's very notable. Uh, we haven't heard uh, acoustic guitar in Rush on a f quite a few Rush albums, I think. Maybe is it Permanent Waves was the last time acoustic an acoustic was heard? Maybe not. I'm, don't don't quote me on that. So that's kind of significant, and uh, that certainly you know it heralds their um, you know it heralds that moment where they're really thinking of toning down the synthesizers. But there are still synths on Presto, but. Um, yeah, the acoustic guitar is nice. The song is okay. It's never been one of my favorites. Um, one of the times that I saw Rush live, they actually did play Presto, so that would have been the Time Machine tour. Um, so that was cool. It was definitely a concert highlight. It was great to hear it live, but uh, it was never one of my favorites on the album. Again, sorry. <laughs> uh, we flip the record over. We flip the record over, and we get to Superconductor uh, opens the second side. Uh, now this is one of my favorites on the, on the album. This is a great track. Um, you know, punchy riff in 7-8. Um, again, it could be heavier, but it is, you know, in context of the album, it's one of the heavier tracks, actually. Uh, I really, really like it. I think, um, it's funny, there's kind of satirical lyrics on it, um, you know, talking about making, uh, you know, overly simplistic music. I think they're, I think it, they're meant to be a little satirical. Uh, it's kind of ironic, because in a lot of ways, that's what Rush were doing, you know, they, they were... They were far beyond. They, they were at this point. They're far beyond doing stuff like Cygnus X One and all the kind of crazy instrumental stuff. You know, it is a very toned down rush in a lot of ways. Um, so it's kind of funny that they're doing a satire about that. But uh, still, it's a great song. I really, I actually really like the middle section where we get uh, that kind of orchestral synth sound. Boom, down, down, down. I think that's a really, really nice part. Uh, and yeah, it's just a great riff. And then towards the end, the key changes just keep getting higher and higher and higher. And uh, that's coupled with the synth, that synth uh, line and whatnot. And it just, it's one of those great mo rush moments when it just gets more and more epic and the energy just reaches, you know, a ridiculous level. Uh, so yeah, Superconductor is definitely uh, a very ace track on the album. So um, good for Superconductor. <laughs> uh, we move on to uh, the next track, track two of side two, Anagram for Mongo. Uh, now this, this kind of gets a little boring for me. Uh, musically, I'm not really a big fan of it, to be honest. It's... Uh, there's definitely that poppy vibe, you know, there, there's, uh, it's a, it's a far cry from anything, any of the heavy stuff that Rush had done, and any of the, you know, really proggy stuff as well, you know, it's, it doesn't really do anything for me. The lyrics are kind of interesting, um, the lyrics feature all kinds of anagrams, and there's, you know, he's, he's using letters in a, in a certain way, which is, which is kind of neat, but never been one of my favorite Rush songs, unfortunately. Uh, we move on to track three of side two, Red Tide. Uh, I know this one I really like as well. It's funny. I, you know, I think it's a great thing that they're moving away from the synthesizers, but the songs with synth with more, the most synthesizers on this album tend to be the ones that I really like. I'm not sure why that is. Uh, but Red Tide is really great. The opening with the, with, uh, that piano thing and, uh, you know, that big, you know, it's kind of dated sound. Ba, 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 ba. Um... You know, the, the, it's, a, it's all sequencers and synthesizers right at the, bin, right at the beginning, so that, that's really interesting. But uh, it's a great song. I just really like that hook. I like, you know, and the red tide kisses the shore. There's a great sort of energy there, and um, yeah, it's a, it, it's a great track. Definitely one of, one of my favorites on the second side of the album. Uh, anyway, I think the first side is probably the better side in the long run. Uh, but yeah, red tide's good. Uh, we head over to Hand Over Fist. Uh... Pretty good song, but not the greatest. Uh, there's a couple of cool moments with some guitar riffs. Um, you think it's going to be really funky at first. When you first hear uh, Lifeson's uh, guitar coming, you think it's going to go into some really funky thing, but it, it kind of goes into that, you know, poppy thing, I guess. I'll say the word poppy. It's not a bad word. Um, but it's okay. You know, the lyrics are cool. You know, there's rock, paper, scissors, imagery, um, that kind of thing. That's what... Uh, I think that's what gives us the uh, image on the inner sleeve here. We have 
the variations of uh, rock, paper, scissors. So that's, that kind of imagery is in the lyrics, so that's kind of cool. But again, not, not the greatest song ever. Sorry. Not one of my favorite albums, I'm afraid. I do apologize. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I gotta be honest, right? I can't uh, just say everything's great. Uh, then we finally move on to uh, track 5 of side uh, 2, track uh, 11 overall, Available Light, that wraps the album up. And uh, this one's pretty good. It's not, it's not as good as, you know, Show Don't Tell or The Pass or Scars or anything. Uh, but it's cool. I, I like the, the opening. is very stark and spacious. And again, we get the, the piano is right there, so they're still using lots of keys at this point. Um, but uh, the stark opening is very nice, and it's very dramatic, and uh, yeah, particularly that when the chorus comes up, we've got, In the available light. That's, uh, that, that's you know, kind of a, a it's, it's approaching classic Rush territory, but it's not quite there. Uh, but it does it does an okay job of wrapping the album up. Um, you know, they they would this kind of starts a phase where they they forgot how to wrap their albums up with a really really great strong you know proper number. Uh, and I'm not sure why that is because you know their their early albums would always end with just a a, a mind bender. It was always a big big grand finale. And uh, starting around here, the 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 final song would tend to just be another song on the album for whatever reason. I'm not sure why that is. I'm not sure why I perceived it that way, but. Uh, there you go. Uh, it, Available Light is still a pretty good song. And it wraps up the album fairly nicely. Uh, so yeah, uh, it is a good album. Um, you know, like Hold Your Fire, it's not one of my favorites. But uh, hey, it's, uh, it's like I said, it's an important stepping stone and Rush certainly needed to do it to get to where they got to. And uh, where they got to is pretty cool. Uh, so uh, stay tuned for more conversations on where they got to after Presto. Uh, so if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, subscribe, comment below, all the rest of that. And um, stay tuned next time for Roll the Bones. So we'll see you then. Take care.